I'm sure many of you have heard someone say, communism sounds good on paper. And perhaps you've also heard your World War II friends say, Stalin ruined communism. If Lenin stayed alive, it would have been better. Well, in my humble opinion, both of those are wrong. Communism was not a desirable end in the first place, and Stalin only made a bad situation worse. Before I get into my scathing indictment of communism, I want to trace its origins in socialism and the difference between the two. Socialism, in many ways, is the product of the Enlightenment and the French Revolution. These two work together, with the help of the printing press, to shape European opinion about how much the common man was entitled to from society, the government, and the corporations they worked for. In the world of the rising Industrial Revolution and rapid urbanization, people began to move from small-scale production of goods with people you're familiar to large-scale production with people you don't know making the modern worker. At this point, Europe, aside from being quasi-feudal, is a libertarian paradise. As industrialists rise and workers flood the cities, there's basically no regulation on how this whole thing is supposed to work. And as such, the industrialists are making massive profits off of small children losing their fingers. This was an obvious problem to most normal people, but there was no obvious solution. One such solution was presented in the mid-1800s as socialism, which was put forward in a variety of fashions by a variety of thinkers. In general, they all wanted some form of communal ownership of the means of production. This ranged from wanting direct ownership of corporations and resources, with people getting a say in how those resources are used and how corporations function, to the mild form of socialism seen today in America, in which taxes are taken out of your pay and set up for your eventual retirement or inability to work. There's very little agreement amongst the wide variety of socialists, but ultimately, they all want some form of power and security to be given to the average person. And different levels of socialism were tried out in different countries. This wellspring of socialist ideas brings about one particular strain of socialism, which Marx calls communism. Communism, as defined by Marx and Engels, is basically the most extreme form of socialism. To them, workers would eventually be so sick of the capitalist economy that they would band together cross-culturally and overthrow their collective bourgeois oppressors and form a communal economy with no national boundaries that was to the benefit of all workers, at the expense of the bourgeoisie and the peasants who Marx wasn't a huge fan of. From each according to his ability, to each according to his need. This has proven to be, by far, one of the most successful pipe dreams ever conceived. And this was a pipe dream, just some ramblings of a broke, discontent writer, and nothing unique to the 19th century. But then, the Paris Commune happened. In 1871, the Prussians were sieging Paris and declaring the glorious German Empire. While this was going on, the French declared the Third Republic, except for Paris, which decided to be a self-governing commune. This was a big to-do in Europe, and soon the French were sieging their own capital to reclaim it from a bunch of, more or less, random citizens who decided they didn't like the new France and wanted to make some socialist utopia. This was sort of the case, but also the place was a mess and doomed to failure. However, because of his writings, and the fact that he talked about the need for a violent uprising, the whole enterprise was blamed on Marx, who had nothing to do with this at all. The revolutionaries weren't even influenced by his writings and somehow the French public still blamed him. Marx, like any disgruntled guy who feels like society doesn't appreciate him enough, ate this up and was thrilled that he was suddenly a celebrity. The fact that everyone hated him was of no concern. In his mind, the revolution was underway. But the Paris Commune was crushed, and the revolution would take another 46 years to happen. And it happened under a guy named Lenin. Lenin, another outcast, was famously in exile in Switzerland when Germany was like, hey, do you want to go start a revolution? And Lenin knew his time had come. But the joke was on the Germans, because soon their workers would be overthrowing their dumb monarchy. At least, that was the plan. Lenin, though invested in Marx's ideas, had a war to win in Russia first. And to do so, he would team up with some criminal named Joseph. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Lenin, while leading the country for the brief time that he did, was quite industrious and made several reforms to varying use to the average worker. First, he wasn't a fan of elections or voting because he figured he wouldn't be getting the vast majority of those votes, and he wasn't inclined to compromise with more moderate socialists. He did try to abolish ranks in the military and have soldiers elect their own leaders, but it was mostly to out the nobles who generally held the officer positions. He did present a land reform, which was already underway before he took power, but he was nice enough to legitimize it. Then he took Russia out of the war to encourage soldiers to abandon their posts and come claim land, which seemed Seems like a solid scheme for somebody trying to get the average peasant, I mean worker, on board with your new regime. He made several sweeping socialist reforms, and 
By that, I mean he nationalized a lot of institutions and created several social programs. This was relatively radical at the time. He also started the process of state capitalism, in which the state took over major businesses, but left smaller ones intact until they were large enough to be incorporated into the state. Which is a terrible economic model that Russia and other Eastern Bloc nations used to mass-produce utilitarian goods, but little to no consumer goods for joy or comfort. Still, he was nice enough to let the small businesses go. He also incited violence against the kulaks, or wealthier peasants in the Ukraine, and demanded they hand over their grain to help feed the people. He told crowds to kill kulaks, anyone illegally selling grain for their own personal profit, and looters, leading to much bloodshed. Finally, like any good dictator, he set up labor camps to deal with anyone he didn't like. So really, Lenin was a realist dictator and a socialist. He marginalized opponents and moderates while making reforms to benefit the poorer elements of society to build up support while his enemies were unable to do so. Lenin was masterfully handling a very difficult situation, but his health was declining and he died only two years after ending the Civil War. His death led to the rise of one Joseph Stalin, who would spend the next 30 years building a country and destroying its people. Stalin decided, first off, on a policy of communism in one country, which was to say he wasn't going to help other communist revolutions. The European communist revolutions that broke out in 1918 to 1923 had all failed except for the one in Russia. So Russia was going to need to be ready to defend itself from all the countries that Marx figured would have had revolutions already, and sell weapons to peasants, I mean workers, who wanted to revolt in the future. Besides that, Russia itself was lacking in workers to revolutionize, so Stalin decided to fix that. Russia had been slowly but steadily industrializing over the course of the 19th and early 20th centuries. But the Civil War was a bit of a setback, and Stalin decided to quicken this process a bit by removing people from their countryside homes, sticking them in cities, and making them good workers, while collectivizing the rest of the farms and ending the kulaks once and for all. This was cool, except for the poor planning and the fact that basically all of Russia's money was going to industrializing, which went great as long as you ignored the starvation that went on across the country. This led to the deaths of some six or seven million people. But hey, it's Russia and they have millions more to spare. So Stalin figured he'd try this whole five-year plan thing again, like four more times, until they got it right. Meanwhile, when he wasn't busy being a terrible father, Stalin generally did normal dictator stuff, like silence the opposition, eliminate anyone more popular than him, eliminate anybody who could be more popular than him, and generally just eliminating everyone. Then Germany invaded, and he now had an excuse to set up like six new communist regimes, all while not moving closer to actual communism or world revolution. To be fair to Stalin, the Soviet Union would not have been able to contend with Germany in World War II or the US in the Cold War if he didn't industrialize the country immediately. On the other hand, he killed millions of people due to poor planning and carelessness, something he showed no remorse for which is even a step down from Mao, who at least seems to feel some regret over the number of people who starved in his country during the Great Leap Forward. Stalin was a bad dude, but the fact that he's one of the worst people to ever lead a country shouldn't detract from the fact that Lenin was also a dictator who repressed opposition and removed what little freedom there was in the society he ruled. Did Stalin ruin communism? No. Communism was never going to make it, Stalin or no Stalin. If Trotsky took over Russia, he would have invaded Eastern Europe and started World War II years earlier, leading to the demise of the Soviet Union, which the world pretty universally distrusted at the time. Sure, Trotsky may have been more closely in line with Marx's ideology, as he believed in permanent revolution, and yeah, he claimed to believe in the dictatorship of the proletariat, but that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. If you kill the managerial class of people and elevate workers with no training, I'm willing to bet most of them will be bad at management and, oh, I don't know, poorly manage your five-year plan? On top of that, permanent revolution doesn't make a stable state, as any time people settle into being the managerial class, you have to purge them. Then you have to purge the people who don't want you running things. You basically have to be purging everyone who wants stability constantly, leaving you with the most rambunctious and aggressive members of society, then sending them off to war. Which is like playing Total War on Legendary, declaring war on everyone on turn one, and having your nobles killed. This sounds like a political ideology made by frat boys. It's not an effective model of governance. I'm not surprised Stalin was able to get everyone on board by saying he was not going to war with everyone for workers that, realistically, no one cared about. People don't like total war all the time. People don't like the fear of purges all the time. People don't like political commissars deciding if you're loyal enough to the party. And Trotsky and Lenin both favored all of these things. Does communism sound good on paper? Well, yeah, everything sounds good on paper. It's all hypothetical. 
In a perfect world, communism would work, just like every other socioeconomic model. Socialism, libertarianism, feudalism, these all worked perfectly on paper. But this isn't paper. This is the real world. Countries and kingdoms are not run by imaginary, perfect people. They're run by imperfect, real people. So all systems fall short. When you make a system, you have to judge it based on its goals and its accomplishments. And communism has accomplished very few of its goals. In practice, true communism is unattainable. No country has ever reached the communist phase of development, and they've all claimed to be in a transitory phase of socialist revolution. No communist government has tried to incite a worldwide workers' revolution, with the USSR being the only one that even bothered to try to fund any revolution at all, and certainly fell short of Marx's dreams given how many rural countries decided to be communist over industrialized ones. No industrialized nation has ever had a successful communist revolution because eventually those governments establish a more moderate form of socialism which satisfies everyone. Most people don't want a violent revolution, and when they do, they don't want communism. What people want is to live comfortably, and when any form of government provides that, people are willing to go along with it, and when things are uncomfortable, they rebel. Communism was, and remains, a pipe dream. I feel the need to give this scathing indictment of communism because for some reason, people still advocate for it. I don't need to sit here and give a lecture on how bad Nazis are, because we already know. It's been discredited. Only some 20 odd nations were ever communist in the way we think of it, and only five of them are still around. And they've abandoned the pursuit of communist society and a worldwide workers' revolution. They've even abandoned state capitalism. In short, they've stopped trying to be communist and just reverted to dictatorships. It's almost like people don't like a state of perpetual revolution and like a little bit of stability, even if it means dealing with stuff they don't like sometimes. Communism has been discredited, but for some disgruntled poor people who feel like the world should appreciate them more, they still harbor delusions of grandeur that they'll be some communist god that finally incites the world revolution, when at best you'd be some dictator of a rural country where people would starve because of your desire to industrialize. If you're going to dream of being a dictator, at least pick to be a military one so you have some real chance of taking over your country. In short, socialism is fine, and I'm willing to debate to what degree we should be socialist. But communism, being the most extreme form of socialism, is not what we want, and it's generally not the most extreme form of anything that works out for people. There's a reason why communists never get elected. If you're a communist and you like this channel, please don't feel like I hate you. I'm glad you're here, and I want to make quality content for all my proletariat friends. But if through some miracle I become president, I'm not giving you a cabinet position. Uh, the video is basically over, but quick update about the channel. If you just came here for communist stuff, you can go now. Uh, I released a political analysis, historical analysis, and an alternate history before April 21st, and the alternate history has crushed any numbers I could have possibly been expecting. Uh, I'm going to continue to do political and historical analyses, but they won't be the focus. They will be a sort of preparatory video to discuss the topic that the next couple of uh, alternate histories will be discussing. Um, on top of that, as I do these, they're going to be moving backwards through time, so I'm going to focus on the communist countries and the uprisings in the 20s, and then I'll be moving on to World War I, and so on and so forth. Uh, anyways, thanks for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe. I'll have another alternate history out within a few weeks.